Okay, you ready? All set. Are you guys ready? Yeah, we're ready. Oh. We're right so we on. captured all that. We we're <laughs> trying to catch you say something crazy. <laughs> Hannah, hi. Hi, Matt. Um, you know, everybody craps on Twitter because it's this hate fest where everybody trolls each other. But I use it to curate news and to find new people, and that's how I found you. We've never met before, but that's it's right. good to meet. Good to meet you, too. I've admired your work for some time, so very excited to be here. And uh, you run an organization called Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty, mm -hmm. but you seem to write about just about everything now. Um, do you ever sleep? Because you're, you're cranking out <laughs> stuff all the time. I'm one of those people that has insomnia. And so what do you do when you're up and nobody else is? You you know either go on Twitter and probably get yourself fired the next day or you go write articles. So that yeah. seems to be a better outlet for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know what I would have done if, if I was 20 years old on Twitter. I never would have gotten hired by a Republican, that's for sure. And that might have changed my career, maybe for the better. I have all of these <laughs> Who knows? Republican skeletons in my closet. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to grow up with. I was sort of right at the cusp of it, and I'm a pastor's kid, so I'm sort of used to being under the microscope 24-7, and because of that, I was always pretty cautious on social media, and I had parents that were reminding me I needed to be cautious. So thank God I sort of avoided some of the big pitfalls, but if it had come about when I was even younger than that, if I hadn't had that added pressure, there's no telling what would be out there. Yeah. It's just, it's a hard thing to have everything you've done publicly. Publicly recorded. I was a crazy, strident libertarian who knew everything when I was 20 years old, and that would have been a disaster <laughs> if, if there was any documentation of any of that. Right, as most libertarians are yeah. at some point in their lives. So. Well, we, we're a disaster every day, let's be honest. <laughs> but, uh, and you call yourself a conservative libertarian or a libertarian conservative? Yeah, I What's of, qualifying what there? I straddle that fence. You know, I think, in my opinion, I'm a libertarian, but, you know, who's the real libertarian is the ongoing joke. And I think when I get into uh, LP, a capital L circle, I realize I'm not maybe as libertarian as I think. And then when I'm in a conservative circle, I feel far more libertarian than I think. So I, I think I'm on the fence there. Um, my views are really based around policy more than party. And so I don't like to just put myself in one bucket. I care most about limiting the government, about making sure we have free markets and about individual liberty. And as long as people are working on those aspects, then I can work with anybody and, and kind of fit in anywhere. We talk about this a lot on this show, but that's actually what liberalism used to be. Right. And I hate that, that like, I, I use the word libertarian just because I don't know what else to use, but yeah. that the whole label things can be off-putting. It's safer to say you're a libertarian because people don't know enough about us yet to automatically hate everything we stand for. But if you say Republican or Democrat and you're trying to talk to somebody who doesn't identify with that, you've, you've stopped the conversation. I think that's right. And I think libertarian opens up a lot of doors. I know when I was first um, coming through college, I wasn't going to college to be in politics. I was in the music industry initially for my first career. And I had a friend that said, I think you're a libertarian. And I thought, that sounds like a liberal. I'm definitely not that. You know, I have no idea what that is, but no. Um, but I love the F.A. Hayek short essay, Why I'm Not a Conservative. I think that he really gets into the language barriers that we have around describing what our viewpoints are. But it comes down to the fact that we have really one party, one school of thought in this country, and it's progressivism. And yeah. conservative is... At, at the end of the day, mostly just slow progressivism. It's yeah. moving in the same direction. They don't have alternate ideas. They're just slowing down the process. And they'll be where progressives are in another 10 years. And so, you know, classical liberalism, libertarianism is an actual other school of thought that has real solutions to problems that I think we can agree upon with most liberals in American um, language. And so I, I like the term libertarianism, but at times it can be tainted as well, just due to certain yeah. characters who have been a bit more notorious or a bit more visible in the party. Uh, we have our characters. That That's one of my favorite essays. And by the way, part of this, the ethos of this show is that everybody watching now has to go get a cocktail because we mentioned St. Saint, <laughs> Saint Hayek. I like it. It's a good um, theory. <laughs> but I, I, that's, I always recommend uh, to, and I, and I won't go too far down this, this rabbit hole, but there's two Hayek essays that I recommend for people that want to sort of get into the that sort of way of thinking about, about classical liberalism and why I'm not a conservative is one of them. And the other one is the use of knowledge in society. And they're, and they're very much related because the reason that Hayek is not a conservative in the European sense is that um, he's not a fascist. Mm -hmm. And he's not someone that wants to use the power of the state to impose a set of values on people and, and maybe recapture 
the mythical glories of, of the past. And, and I do watch the, the, the current politics today. Um, I'm a little hands off. I don't, I don't want to get too close, but um, I wonder where did that voice of liberty go to? I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Republicans actually tried to balance the budget. Mm-hmm. It's not I've a thing. It's not times. a th- <laughs> ancient times. They were wearing sandals and robes and right. things like that. <laughs> um, what happened to those guys? Yeah, you know, for me growing up Republican and kind of being on the outskirts of political work, I was taught that Republicans cared about these issues that I named, free markets, limited government, individual liberty. And as I got a little bit older and was getting, you know, college, it was around the time of Romney, and starting to actually watch what they were doing, watch their hands, watch their votes, and being a bit of gas, like, hold on a second, you guys don't actually push for any of this. You say it out in loud, out public, but that you don't actually go and work for it behind the scenes. And it was really, um, it was striking to me. And then as I began working in policy and actually getting into the political field, initially in Tennessee, traveling around speaking to Tea Party groups, speaking to Republican luncheons, and hearing a lot of what eventually became Trumpism, you know, a lot of nationalist rhetoric, a lot of things that were targeting certain population groups, which was nothing to do with the type of conservatism I had been brought up in. And it really kind of frightened me because I do see authoritarianism as the real danger. No, no matter what kind of theory it is coming under the name of, it's that's the real problem. And I think, you know, it goes back to being a preacher's kid. Um, I don't like being told what to do, being micromanaged. I don't like seeing other people being told what to do or micromanage. And I think so often Christians have really been the voice of authoritarianism in our country. And I saw that happening under the Republican Party, especially with Trump. And so it really um, was off-putting to me and something that I think more people should be concerned about. But it also said to me that most people who were Republicans in our country didn't actually know what they believed or why. They were kind of just on a team. They were affiliated with that team. They really hated the other team for some reason. And it had nothing to do with these policy sort of wonky ideas that I had. Well, there was a there was a time, so I used to be a Tea Party organizer, and I remember a time around 2010, 2011, we had we had, had our big sweep election where the house was turned over and we had, you know, we elected a lot of guys like like Justin Amash, Thomas Massey come two years came, came two years later. Uh, but Rand Paul and Mike Lee, and and there was really an opportunity to get that sort of constitutional conservative libertarian um, liberty perspective in there. But but the activists would always come up to me, and, and these are moms and dads and really busy people, and they had bought all of the books that we were talking about, and they had a Hayek book in there somewhere, and they were they they would all tell me the same story. They had them stacked beside their bed, and they were just frustrated because. They wanted to sort of fill in the blanks, backfill this this gut feeling they had for for liberty and constitutional uh, limits on on government, but they didn't have time. And and I feel like we we missed an opportunity to backfill that before some some political opportunists jumped on the stage and said, "I'm the guy you should be listening to." And and unfortunately, politics kind of corrupted that process. But but there's there's always time. There's always an opportunity to fill that in, and I think both parties are now giving us a chance to, to point out that authoritarianism, regardless of, of who's wearing that brand, is dangerous. I think that's right, and I do see a real curiosity, interestingly enough, from the left right now, where I talk really openly about capitalism. I love defending capitalism. I think it's been poorly defended, poorly articulated, poorly defined by so many people in our camp for so long. And so I'm very vocal about it and talking about what it actually is, because what I'm finding is a lot of people on the left are very open to capitalism and free markets. The problems that they've been seeing and who's responsible for those problems, they've been taught to blame on capitalism, when really, if you start unwinding the problem, you trace it right back to government intervention into the market. And so there's this huge opportunity to educate people and to really do outreach right now. It can feel like we're losing, but I see a tremendous vacuum and a void that we can step into and fill if we take the time. Yeah, and I see that like going back to the founding of Occupy Wall Street and the, and the Tea Party, the, their gut instinct was the Wall Street bailout was bad. Mm-hmm. And what they were really objecting to was not capitalism, it was crony capitalism. Right. And, and I'm, I'm sort of coming closer and closer to, I guess you would call it a sort of a progressive skepticism of big things because I see this inevitable collusion between big corporations. You know, Jeff Bezos is always going to play with the chairman. It's just it's part of his business and it may be difficult for him not to, but but I worry about about the bigness of corporations because they're always created by government special favors or government uh, colluding and keeping the small guys out of the system. 
So I don't know. There may be a there may be a sort of bottom up consensus amongst uh, honest progressives, um, not not authoritarian progressives. I don't know what to call the old uh, the old guard, the the uh, civil libertarians that that used to really kind of dominate the left, and now they seem to be gone. Yeah, I think they're there, and I you know I work in criminal justice reform, so I happen to work with a lot of them who are actually really bothered by where their party's going. They don't like their current nominees, Biden and Harris, who both have terrible criminal justice you know histories, and they really do care about civil liberties. They still care about wars, and so we have a lot of commonality actually. And I think um, I love the book How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie. I read it at least once a year. But you know, one of the things he says is find a way to agree first, and then start working together. And when I talk to people on the left that are in that camp, we can agree on a lot of the problems. And if you really start working through the root cause of those problems, it is government. So, you know, I wrote an article for the Washington Examiner a couple weeks ago about the billionaires thing, because it's so trendy right now to hate billionaires. And there's all these critiques of them, but the critiques miss the mark. There is a real problem with billionaires. And it's what you just said. They are rigging the system. They are getting corporate welfare. We're not in a true capitalist society or in a, in a fair playing field at all. But because people don't understand capitalism very well, they can't necessarily always say, okay, this is capitalism. This is a free market. This is intervention into it. This is a government created problem. And so if we can actually, you know, agree first and then start working through that, I think we could really get somewhere and maybe build a new type of coalition. Um, and then, of course, you have a lot of people who have been pushed out of the Republican Party due to Trump. And so there's there's a lot of people out there that I think are up for grabs and we just need to organize and really start building something with them, which is easier said than done. Obviously, you and I both know there's a lot of barriers to third parties and to different coalitions coming in and really um, taking effect. But I think that you can still, even without necessarily gaining political seats, do a tremendous amount of work in simply educating people, changing the narrative, and really starting to influence hearts and minds. And that will then flow through elections. Yeah, and I, I think um, we, we do a lot of work on, on mass incarceration and criminal justice reform as well. And it's, it's very much um, a teachable story about what happens when you give government too much power. And, you know, we, we have this, this, this shocking mass incarceration problem in our country. We're supposedly the land of the free and home of the brave, but, but we lock everybody up and put them in cages for, for nonviolent crimes, which I struggle to even understand how that's a crime if you didn't hurt anybody else or take their stuff. But it's, to me, it's, uh, you know, I say this all the time, Ber Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul had, had a lot of things in common that were attractive to young people because they were raging against the machine. And, and most of Bernie's rage is against things that were caused by concentration of government power, like mass incarceration. Uh, and I know you work on a lot of that. Um, and I want to get into, um, I definitely want to talk about, about the death penalty. Um, how did you get involved in that organization? And is it unusual for conservatives to be concerned about the death penalty? I think it was. I think I think that's changing pretty rapidly. But I was I'm a testament to how fast it can change. I was very much a tough on crime person. I thought the death penalty was perfectly fine. I thought it was fine ethically, but also more importantly, I thought that it deterred crime. I thought if I were the victim's family member, I would want it. I thought it saved money. You know, there's all these myths around how it actually operates. And for most people, up until the you know age of information, unless you were personally impacted by it, had a family member in the system, you really just didn't know how it was operating. So for many people, I think they, even when they were limited government people, even when they were critical of government as a whole and knew that it was prone to error and to corruption, they just sort of exempted the Justice Department from that for whatever reason, and I was certainly in that camp. Um, I stumbled into this work when I was still in the music industry. I was doing some pro bono lobbying for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I was very passionate, I think, you know, so often free market people don't come in and try to find solutions for things like mental health issues, which we should be doing. And it was through that work that I was first asked to work on the death penalty. And I said, no, I can't do that bill for you. I don't agree on that at all. I'm very pro death penalty. And they said, for people with mental illness? <laughs> I was like, yes. Like, so I started doing my research. I realized I didn't know what I was talking about. And was really aghast at what I found. You know, I say that support for the death penalty runs a mile wide and an inch deep because I think support can be knee-jerk high. But the minute I get in front of people and give a five-minute spill even on exactly what's happening behind the scenes or, you know, just they get to see that through documentaries, through podcasts, what's actually happening in our justice system, they turn really fast. You've had one person exonerated in this country for every nine executions. That in and of itself is shocking, you know, and that's fully exonerated. There have been hundreds of others who have been 
wrongfully convicted and either taken Alfred pleas or had their trials reversed or who were not discovered and who were executed while being innocent. So uh, we know we kill innocent people every year. I feel very certain of that. And that, for anyone who says they care about individual liberty and limited government, is a huge problem. And then you get into the cost, the fact that it's not a deterrent, the opportunity cost involved in that. You know, we still saw very few crimes. I think the average homicide clearance rate year in and year out hovers about 60 percent. So that's 40 percent of murder victims who are getting absolutely no justice, no closure. And then as you move down into other violent crimes like rape, um, it's even lower statistically. So that's a huge amount of money that we're wasting on a system that really does nothing to make us safer. Yeah, I, I had a, I had the same um, um, knee-jerk reaction, uh, being pro-death penalty for um, a lot of years, and 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 my my change of heart happened when I actually sat as a juror in a in a, a attempted murder trial, mm-hmm. and and I realized just watching the process and that um, getting at truth and like jurors didn't understand what the rules were and the prosecutor wasn't really interested in, in educating them. The judge was horrible, and people had all of these, these preconceived notions about guilt and innocence before they even sat down for the trial. And I realized this is a, this is a grossly unpredictable system by which to decide whether or not someone should live or die. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a de- democratic politics, small d democratic politics in a nutshell. You, you don't know exactly what the people are going to do, and I, I, I just think it would, it would the, the idea that you would, you would kill an innocent person, is, is just not acceptable in a, in a, in a, in a society that where we supposedly value life and we value people's freedom. So, so I, I came around to that position, but, but it, the knee-jerk reaction, particularly you see a horrific crime, um, you know some some monster slaughters a family and your, your knee-jerk reaction is you want justice. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't really work. No, and we, and we ask the wrong questions. You know, I think wanting justice, even wanting vengeance, is a normal human reaction in the face of violence. Violence is terrible. But our system has never actually done the work to say what causes violence in the first place. What could we be doing to intervene and prevent violence? And because violence is cyclical in nature, and we do know many of the things that can lead to violence. Most people don't wake up and become violent overnight. They're not just born violent. Um, and so that's you know an educational barrier that we have where people in society don't really understand violence as a actual um, medical issue, which I think it can be really a scientific problem that we could be addressing and treating. And instead, we spend a lot of money being very punitive after violence has occurred, but we never actually go in and do the work to prevent it and to make communities safer. And that's more complicated. It's messier. It doesn't always feel as good. But if you work around victims and you work around their family members and you work around people who've even been impacted by the system, whether that be law enforcement, corrections, other people who are impacted by what we do, they will all tell you that that's what they'd actually like to see. That's what they need. And they're not getting it. And so it's just a very flawed system where we're still using pretty antiquated methods to address things we don't like. Like, instead of getting smarter and developing and figuring out how to use our updated knowledge in science and psychology to actually try to make things better long term. So my progressive friends, I, I was very active for many years uh, supporting criminal justice reform, which which tended to focus on nonviolent crimes because it was sort of a gateway to have that broader conversation. But but they pushed me on on whether or not. Um, once violent criminals um, could be redeemed, and I still don't exactly know the answer to that. How far will you go um, to argue that there is there is a there is an opportunity for someone that killed somebody to return to society? Is that a thing? I think it's a thing for sure. I think there's varying levels. You know, some people can be more quickly rehabbed and and reenter society much more quickly. Other people might be an ongoing danger to society, and that's a longer term thing we have to look at. Either way, we know that we have methods to protect society from someone who is ongoingly violent without having to resort to the death penalty and all of its complications. Um, but I do think it, it matters when you get involved. You know, we see if you look at adverse childhood effects and their measurements, you can start measuring some of these things that are happening early on in a person's life. We know that most people who do become violent, who do start committing real acts of criminality, typically 
first played the role as being victims themselves. They were typically victimized over and over. Many times they also had family members that were victimized or murdered. And so that does something to your brain, your cognitive abilities. If we were to start intervening early on to try to interrupt those adverse effects, if we were to try to get them treatment early on, I think you're going to see stronger results. Um, and I also do think you see criminality level off around age 25. Once the brain is fully developed and people's cognitive abilities are fully in place, we don't see crime continue in the same capacity later on in people's lives. So I think the timing of it matters. Um, I certainly don't think anybody's life is disposable. As someone who really is a pro-life person holistically, um, I think that it goes against my very belief in ethics and also my religious beliefs to say that someone is too far gone and not able to be redeemed. Now, does that mean they might need to be in prison? Um, yeah, sometimes it does. But I still think that they can find purpose and find meaning behind bars. And I've seen that happen even on death rows across this country. So we've gotten into, uh, we, we did a documentary um, entitled How to Love Your Enemy. And, and we discovered this very cool restorative justice project in Longmont, Colorado. Um, it's a Longmont, uh, I always butcher this acronym. What is it? Longmont Community Justice Partnership. Kathleen's going to be so mad at me. The Longmont Community Justice Partnership, and they've they've found a way, and and I they they focus on young people, you know, people that make a really big mistake at a critical juncture in their life where they could go into the criminal justice system, and they could deny responsibility for what they did, and they could end up in jail, and then they could go through the cycle of of recidivism and and end up a violent criminal. Um, but they they've found a way to basically um, do a community-based alternative to that where they, they deal with what I think is a very libertarian idea of, of making the victim whole. We always talk about making society whole. Well, society wasn't hurt. The victim yeah. was hurt. And I think that that's sort of a, a, a beautiful opportunity to, to bring people together across the political spectrum that are looking for a way to deal with this that doesn't involve Washington, D.C. Because I'd I, there are so few people in Washington, D.C. that actually want to fix this problem. They just want a message and demagogue. Um, Justin Amash points this out all the time. Um, what do you, have you dug into restorative justice at all? Yeah, and Conservatives Concern is actually a project of a larger organization called Equal Justice USA that is doing a lot of that type of practitioner level work in the communities. And so I've gotten to witness it and, and learn from a lot of the people working on our staff about it. Restorative justice as a concept is so exciting to me because I think you're exactly right. It is what the victims, what their family members are asking for. And it's not a big government solution. I think this is something conservatives and libertarians should really get on board with. It's local, it's community driven, it's public private partnerships. It's not a one size fits all approach. Um, it really is working with people to customize plans and figure out, you know, what do you need? If you're a victim of crime, do you need to go in and out of a courtroom for a decade to see if this person's going to get the death penalty? Or do you need therapy? Do you need help relocating if you're in a dangerous position? Do you need assistance with child care if you've lost a spouse or if you've lost an, an income provider? You know, all of these things that people actually need to just get through the first hurdle of surviving crime. And then what do you need? Do you need to have restitution paid to you? Do you need to sit down with the offender and talk with them? You know, you'll find that a lot of people actually want to have that sort of real healing connection of sitting down and figuring out why did you do this and, you know, trying to work through that, getting an apology from them. Whatever it is that person needs, it's very customizable. And I think that's fascinating. We also see a lot of work being done with law enforcement in that regard and really trying to come in and work with them on trauma-informed responses to violence and not just on how they're interacting with people and understanding people in the community's trauma and how that might um, change how they interact with policing, but also to understand their own trauma. You know, I think so often... Uh, we can get, I know even I can get a little bit uh, angry at cops or angry at the profession and how it works, but we, we forget that oftentimes they are victims of crime too and what that does to them and their capacity to respond and how they interact with people. And so I love all of that work. I think it's something that's still really new to a lot of people on the right, um, but there's other things like cure violence and, and things that are even working with gang members where they're bringing in people who are rival gangs in Oakland and um, Newark is a really good example and Baton Rouge that have had these really high crime areas and trying to find ways to actually get those people um, attached to services that are already being offered, job placement, educational services, things that we know will actually prevent ongoing criminality and to try to lessen tensions in, the, in that regard. So I think it's it's fascinating to observe. I just hope I get to keep learning and witnessing it. Yeah, the, the, the police chief in Longmont, uh, Mike Butler, um, tells the story 
of Longmont's uh, sordid history on criminal justice. And he, he describes a period um, a couple decades ago where they had their own Ferguson and they, they did some self-reflecting and he, and he was entrepreneurial enough to look for an alternative way of doing things. But it strikes me that um, all, of the, all of the anger and violence and partisanship today that this this is a this is a happy solution that actually works. Mm-hmm. Like we, we, this is not a theory. This is not a piece of legislation. They have they have twenty years of experience doing this, and a bunch of other communities have as well. And it but it also sort of exposes the the total BS of Washington D.C. because everybody's painting Black Lives Matter on streets, but but nobody's actually fixing some pretty obvious flaws with our criminal justice system. Um, that that is an unplanned but perfect segue to a piece you just wrote about Kamala Harris. I I, I think it's um, funny and tragic as a libertarian that the Democrats have actually seated a ticket that is worse on criminal justice reform than law and order Donald Trump. How did how did that happen? Well, it's it's infuriating. I'm pretty mad about it, honestly. And uh, you're so right. It's it's become so performative. Um, criminal justice reform is popular. Every time we poll it, it polls well on both sides. It's something people genuinely want. You see people being voted out of office for not being um, as informed or active on this issue. This is something that really works with the general public. And so to see people in Washington D.C. at the federal level using that as a way to be performative and make people think that they're you know on their side as you were pointing out earlier a lot of people want to be informed a lot of people do care about issues but they simply don't have the time to dig in and so for the democrats to tell them you know this is something we care about black lives matter we're leading on this and then to put up joe biden and kamala harris I don't think the average American knows those two people's background on criminal justice reform unless you're like me and you live and breathe this stuff every day. Well, in but, fairness, I, I'm not sure Joe Biden remembers <laughs> his record on this. But. He might not. He might have genuinely forgotten. Kamala knows what she did, though. Yeah, she and, knows um, what she did. And, and the DNC knows what they did. And, and so to me, it's... Um, it's highly disrespectful to so many people that are genuine in this, that are putting their money where they you know, want to see action, that are really trying to affect change in our society for an important issue. I think it's embarrassing to me, our criminal justice system. It's a mockery of our foundational principles. It's something that I think in 100 years people look back and say, how did you let that happen? You know, We look back at all these other horrors in history and think, who, who are the people just sitting on the sidelines letting this occur? But it's a lot of people in this country. And so they're complicit in that. And it reminds me of you know the stuff with Bill Clinton and the Me Too movement, where it's you recognize very quickly they don't actually care. They're just trying to use this as a talking point to yeah. to rally voters and then do nothing about it. And so that's something that I see on both sides. That's why I've really given up on the two main parties. I don't trust them at all. But Kamala's record, um, it actually isn't special, is what's significant about Kamala's record. You know, she's a former district attorney. That is the main opposition to criminal justice reform in this country. People always say, why don't you get more bills passed? There is one organized group in every state capital that is spending a lot of money to block almost any kind of criminal justice reform legislation that comes up. And it's just it's the district attorney's conferences or unions or whatever they're called in each state. Um, So she was a part of that crew. And then she went on to become an attorney general. You know, she's gotten a lot of criticism for blocking DNA evidence for being tested for a death row inmate in California who was potentially innocent. That happens every day. People don't recognize just how difficult it is when you have a potentially wrongful conviction in the system to get it worked out, to get new evidence tested, to get a new trial, to in any way, um, they think the appellate process is doing that when it's not. It's kind of just checking on procedural things. It takes outside groups, typically like the Innocence Project or others working pro bono, to come in and really force some of these things and move them. So what she did is interesting to me because it's not exceptional, but people were aghast about it. You know, when Tulsi called her out during the debates, which I thought was an amazing moment, most people had no idea that was her background. And so I, I do, I am happy that that's been exposed, that people are sort of recognizing the hypocrisy there because it is a really huge flaw in their ticket. But um, I don't think they'll pay for it. And that's what's the most frustrating thing. Yeah, yeah like uh, the, the politics of the moment, they, um, and both parties are equally guilty of this. They, they can erase your, your record and what you actually stand for, and you can you can have this magical metamorphosis where you just dis- totally disagree with what you said yesterday. It's very frustrating, um, and I always hope that that technology and social media would sort of level the playing field. And I think it has to a certain extent. You can you can actually, if you're curious, you can Google Joe Biden 1994 crime bill and find out all the crazy stuff that he said. Right. 
um, which would never even come out of Trump's mouth. And that's that's sort of the the bizarre world of all of this. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think she'll get away with it. I mean, she she seems to have um, been um, settled in as as the candidate now. Um, and I I I think. I think Justin Amash has has been a bit of a hero, not just on this subject, but particularly this subject. Uh, I, I think I think the impeachment stuff was a bit of a distraction, and, and most people today, when you say Justin Amash, they they have an opinion about impeachment, which defines their opinion of Justin Amash. But that's not that's not who he is. Yeah. Um, but he's he's a guy that actually read legislation, and maybe maybe he doesn't fit in Washington. Maybe that's the problem because he was actually trying to do policy. And, and I can count on maybe one hand the people in Washington that are trying to do policy. That's right. You know that picture from Nazi Germany of all the people in the crowd, and they're all, and there's the one man who's not. That's Justin Amash in our day. I, yeah. think, I think you're right. I think he's a hero. I absolutely adore Justin Amash. Your enemies and, are going to clip that, that picture and, and, yeah. and nail you with it. Crap. Cut that one. <laughs> Should I say that part again? Without no, it? no I'm, jo- okay. I'm joking. I'm joking. There's, um, there's a picture of me from... Uh, I, I learned um, in a very awkward way. There's a picture of me from a Tea Party rally where I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I'm talking about there's a million people on the mall and I'm all excited. I never use my right hand ever again <laughs> never be, again. because it stopped right there. And there's there's yep. a clip for, for our audience as well. Logan, can we cut out that all out? No, we're not cutting that out. <laughs> we're not cutting that out. <laughs> I forget what we're talking about. So I'll say it again in case you will cut it. Um, the picture from Nazi Germany where all of the people are um, hailing Hitler, and you have the one man who's not. To me, that's Justin Amash in yeah. our political system. He's the one person who's really standing up against what's really happening. You know, we were talking about root causes of issues. So many people want to blame the other team, blame this team, that team. It has to do with the fact that both teams are complicit in the problems that we have, and so few people are actually addressing that underlying problem that is in Washington, they're operating almost the exact same. And so I think Justin will be a hero in history. I think right now people might have an opinion about impeachment and tie it to him, but um, history doesn't, isn't going to care about how he voted on impeachment. I think it's going to care about all the other amazing things he's done for policy. And I, um, he actually was the first person I ever applied to work for in politics full time when I was still in the music industry. So he was very fundamental in me developing my beliefs. And I think not only genuinely cared about the policy and read the bills, but did such a great service explaining the bills on his social media and explaining the Constitution in a way that did educate a lot of people who were following him so that they then knew themselves better how to approach policy. Yeah. Um, he is the one point that he's hammering away on that I'm, I'm giving more and more consideration is the, the toxic nature of partisanship. Mm-hmm. And, and part of it's just the, the nature of politics. It's a form of warfare. And, and part of your job is to beat the other team. Um, but that certainly feels like it's devolved into something where it's, it's com- completely 100% cynical and completely devoid of, of any attempt to do policy. And it's just like a feeding frenzy where, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi says she wants $3 trillion and uh, Mitch McConnell says he wants $1 trillion and end up with $5 trillion because that's, that's just, um, they're just going to throw everything in there and it contradicts itself and it, it all grows government. Um, but all that said, like our mission and maybe yours is to get upstream of politics because I think, I think we got to change hearts and minds and we have to animate this, this whole generation of, of young independents that are absolutely turned off by, by partisanship because they, they think it's a cynical game and it is. Mm-hmm. It's become very much bread and circuses. It's it's a bit of a charade. And I think people have talked about for many years now, you know, what was it that got Trump elected and people have pointed to the economy or to the judges. And I think what it really was, was the culture war. Yeah. I think that's what the the people in both parties care the most about right now. It's not actual policy. It's this culture war of whose ideas, whose way of life are we going to force on everybody else, right? And, and that's the real problem is they are trying to force their way of life on everybody else on both sides. Um, the average American isn't going for that, though. You know, we look at how the parties are moving and, and who's in their supporter block, and they are getting more and more fringe, and their their supporters are getting more and more rabid. 
But the average American is not going in that direction. We're over here somewhere in the middle. A lot of people aren't voting. I don't think that that is just because 100 plus million people are lazy or uninvolved. I think it's that they've been disenfranchised. If we want to talk about voter disenfranchisement, let's talk about how the two parties have blocked independent candidates, have blocked third parties, have blocked anyone else who actually wants to come in and focus on the policy from getting anything done. You know, Justin was that kind of person and, and was ostracized for it, even by the Freedom Caucus that he helped build because at the end of the day, people cared more about winning symbolic victories than they did about actually passing real legislation. And so we, we can get those people, but we've got to start mobilizing them and really get them active and engaged if we want to fight back against that. Um, but I think the average American doesn't care about the culture war. They don't care about this two-party fight. They just want to live their lives, pursue the American dream free of government barriers, and just do the right thing. They want to you know, provide for their families, see their friends. They want to go to a football game on Saturdays. They're not into this whole wonky mess that so many of us spend our days thinking about. You know, you know fun has been determined to be un, um, essential, non-essential. <laughs> so there will be no football. There will be no concerts. Alabama, though. Did are, they, are they doing? Alabama okay. said they're going to have people in the stadium. That's my home team. So okay. so, so America. <laughs> Roll Tide. Yeah. Um, so you, you just, uh, speaking of uh, uh, the banning of fun, you just moved from Tennessee to New York? That's right. I had been in, I moved to New York last November. So I had been there less than six months when COVID hit. Nice. <laughs> it was an nice. experience. And now it's a, now it's a ghost town. Oh gosh. I got out in May. I was in a, like a studio apartment in Chelsea and stuck it out for March and April. And then I thought I'm going to lose my mind. So I went back to South Carolina where my family is and it got even worse. You know, you've had all the rioting and looting and protest and the leadership there is just, I knew they were bad. I knew they were bad going there. But good Lord, I mean, if you wanted to get people killed, I don't know that you would do anything differently than what Andrew Cuomo did. Yeah. And the mayor there is just, I don't even know what he's doing. So I, I don't think New York is coming back anytime soon. I think they're in for a pretty sad economic couple of years. Um, you know, there's a lot of predictions around what's going to happen with New York as far as people leaving, the tax base fleeing, and, and what that's going to do to the city. Businesses recognizing they don't need to pay the real estate costs to be in Manhattan. So I think it'll be interesting to see, but I don't think I'll be there for it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll watch I, from afar. I just read a very compelling piece, um, and I wish I remembered the author's name, but he basically argued that, that New York is dead. Like, <laughs> this is it. This is it, and it's it's a it's a it's a perfect storm of all of these things that the the business community has realized that they don't actually need to force everybody to haul their butts downtown New York at in a huge expense and, and all that that stuff. Um, they've killed so many restaurants with the lockdowns that it's hard to imagine them coming back, particularly if businesses stop sort of being that 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 feeder of, of customers. Um, uh, Broadway is dead. Um, the music industry is dead, and it's, and you could you could say this almost about any major city, right. particularly because they all they all seem to have the same mayor, the, <laughs> yeah, that's the, right. the same authoritarian that doesn't really doesn't seem to care, and I I think it's worse than not caring. I I think I think this is a cynical attempt at uh, it's it's a power grab, mm -hmm. and whatever they're doing today. Um, in terms of telling you where you can go and when you can go and that you have to wear a mask or not wear a mask. These are, they, they're, they're training us for a process by which they're going to just tell us in very minute detail how to live our lives. I think that's right. There's definitely an in game um, there. They're not just incompetent. They are incompetent, but there's more to it than that. Um, if you, and, you it's know, more it's, dangerous than incompetent. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it, it surprised me how quickly people have fallen in line, which I think knowing what I know about history and knowing what, what I know about human nature, it shouldn't have surprised me. But I just thought the American spirit was a little more Yeah, we more thought rebellious. we were more ornery than that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, um, you know, New York City didn't surprise me. I was one of the only people the two months I stayed through COVID that was still, you know, going for a walk around the park, just getting out of my place. Um, I knew people that legitimately did not leave their studio apartments for 30, 40 plus days in a row, which is just, you can't do that. That's not healthy. Um, but when I left, went back to South Carolina, you know, I'm back in red state territory. South Carolina actually never really shut down. They suggested a couple things and, you know, it's a very anti-government type state in some ways. Um, and even there, while things are open, when I'm going out and about, there's no one else about. You know, I'm the only person in my yoga class. I'm one of two people at a restaurant. It's, it's interesting 
how much people have just fallen in line for this. Um, and really, the fear factor is so controlling. And, you know, Democrats are already getting a lot that they want from this. If you look at the things they've been able to push for, if you look at how this is helping to rally people to their cause, you force people out of work, it's going to be easier to push for UBI. If you push yeah. people out of work, it's going to be easier to push for, you know, universal health care. And so on and on and on we go, where I think they have every incentive in the world to keep things shut down, not to mention the economic devastation that does and how that might impact the election. Yeah, I remember AOC saying uh, people shouldn't go back to work because those jobs were no damn good anyway. And there's there's sort of a, I mean, on its face, it sounds kind of dumb, but but there's a, I think there's a method to the madness there because if if you if jobs, well, they're not going to exist anyway because they're they're making it very difficult for those businesses to stay in in business. But um, the replacement would be government, right. and basic income and all that stuff. And there's a drive, I think, to invalidate work, um, which in my opinion is is terrible. It's, it, that is dangerous because not only what that does to society and to an economy, but what that does to the human spirit. I think that there is dignity in work. There's dignity in all work. And I'm someone who's had dirty jobs. I'm someone who has done, you know, very um, retail type jobs or service industry driven jobs. And I'm someone who's had, you know, kind of the cushy think tank job. I've been across the spectrum. I've always loved working. I've always found meaning in it. I've always found freedom in it. And I've always found opportunity in it. That is the American dream is to be able to come here and work. Yeah. And so for them to invalidate that and say those jobs were no good anyway, your job was worthless, you shouldn't have to do it, it's demeaning to do it, that's a that's a real problem for me um, on an actual... It's demeaning to the people that work. Yes. Um, because like at, I've I've done all those jobs myself and and I don't think I'm weird, but but I really find meaning in what I do. Like and, and I'm lucky to do what I do now, but but I used to find meaning in, in grinding out just just the grunt jobs that, that we all had to do to to get ahead in the world. And, you know, I, I love picking on AOC, but, like, she talks about economic dignity, and I'm, I'm like, as if um, these guys, we're, we're right across from the Capitol here, as if these right. guys could legislate dignity. Yeah. It's, it's the most disgusting idea that I've ever heard. Uh, dignity is something that weighs on your shoulders, and you have to go earn it and, 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 if the government's locking in your home and taking away your job, imagine imagine the mental health consequences of them taking away that that purpose that you have in your life. Right, and they're taking away your autonomy. Work is what gives you power. You know, being able to earn your own dollar to decide I'm going to earn more money, to decide I'm going to take on a second job if I need to earn money for this or I want to accomplish this, to decide that you want to build your your skill set through other jobs. You know, I was in the music industry. I had no education or formal training in politics. I wasn't going to just jump into politics. I was working on the side doing pro bono lobbying, volunteering, working part-time jobs to get that experience to build my resume, to build my network to where then I could move into the job that I ultimately wanted. And even now, you know, I run a think tank. I also write because I love writing. I love doing commentary, but I'm developing skill sets. I'm learning to do things that then can help further my career down the road. When you take away people's ability to do that, you're taking away their identity. You're taking away their autonomy, their ability to self-determine what they are going to create for themselves. I can't think of anything more depressing than being dependent on the government of all entities to tell me how high I can go and what I can achieve in life. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very Orwellian. And, and this idea that, that, somebody else would decide which job is acceptable for you but i feel like we're going there like i i'm i, I want to i don't want to get too pessimistic but I've, I've been locked down for a long time and i'm i'm very sad about what's happening to to my my city and my country um but i i feel like there's always a counter revolution around the corner and you know we we talked earlier about social media and how toxic that can be but but i think the counter counter revolution is is young people binge watching Joe Rogan or something like that? They're they're curious, mm -hmm. they're self educating, they're sort of hacking the system and and not trusting authorities to tell them what to think, and they're doing it for themselves. I think that's where the revolution comes from, and I, I think it's there. We just have to we have to empower it or at least shed some light on on the idea that that liberty is an alternative. That's right. And I think just as, you know, the shutdown has some silver lining for Democrats and that they can push for things, there's silver linings for us, too. I see a tremendous opening for school choice right now. You know, that's an issue I've worked on that I'm very passionate about. I don't have or want children, but 
getting school choice for kids is in my top three issues because we see what the dumbing down of America results in. And we see um, how quickly we can lose what we have, our republic and what has been built here if we don't have an educated populace. And so right now, you know, the window for school choice is tremendously wide open, even though in years past, it's something that has been difficult on the right and on the left to, to move in states. So I think there's ways that we can seize the day as well and take advantage. Um, I also think that people are recognizing, you know, right now, just the sheer government incompetence uh, at minimum that is going on in this country. Uh, you know, when they want to push for government controlled health care, I'm like, did you see how they, you know, let's look at how New York handled their public health care system during COVID. They got people killed. I wrote an article about this too. There was a fantastic New York Times daily podcast episode examining the death rates between private hospitals in New York City and public hospitals and how all this government cronyism, you know, from the ambulances being contracted and having to take people to the overrun hospitals, even when overflow hospitals were sitting empty, to doctors doctors having their hands tied all day, jumping through hoops for certification and training when they could have been treating patients. Um, all of it got people killed at a rate almost 10 times higher in the public health care system there than in the private health care system. Why do you want these people running your health care? You know, there's real e educational opportunities to point to and to point to just how incapable government is of addressing any kind of controversy that we have, much less things that are as life and death as health care. Andrew Cuomo puts, the, uh, puts a sharp point on the fatal conceit and now he's he, apparently he's come out with a book bragging about what a great job he did. Right. Like, they, they're really good at revisionist history on the left. That yeah. blows my mind how he is coming out a hero in all of this. He, he literally killed seniors with his decisions and then prevented an investigation into the thing that he caused. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a book and talking about book how awesome he was. In the midst of it all. Yeah, it's just amazing how productive he is. I feel like politicians are no damn good. <laughs> right. Almost like I don't trust them. Huh. So we've we've discovered something new on this. Yeah, show. I guess so. I have to be more careful moving forward. Yeah. So so where do we find uh, more of your stuff? You're you're published in a bunch of different places. Yeah. So I'm at Newsmax, Hannah Cox. You can Google me there, and my um, my column will come up. Same thing with the Washington Examiner, or you can follow me at Hannah Cox Seven on Facebook and on Twitter. And so I'm usually resharing most of my content there. If people want more death penalty information, it's conservativesconcern.org. We've got lots of good information at that site. So would love to connect with people. Cool. It's great. Great to catch up. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.